Scotland. What does this word conjure inside your mind? A proud nation of patriots? Rich history? Wild natural beauty? Or stories of old passed down through generations of clans? Perhaps a little of everything. But one thing Scotland speaks loudest of all is its connection to myth and legend. Things that were, things that are, some things that are still debated to this day. Whatever your feelings, Scotland and its surrounding lands are home to some of the most fascinating mythological tales. Stories of mighty gods and goddesses, terrifying beasts, curious creatures, secretive spirits, elusive fairies, and many other enthralling legends. Allow yourself to be swept away by all that we know about these wondrous myths, as well as each having their own soothing story to really capture your imagination. So, as always, lie back, take a deep breath, and welcome to Snooze with Sam's Celtic Myths and Legends. Chapter 1 The Wolver Deep in the Shetland Islands lies a unique creature. The wolver may look frightening, but is not your typical werewolf. Unlike werewolves, who turn from man to wolf at full moon, the wolver remains permanently in a state of half-man, half-wolf. With a wolf's head and a man's body, Covered in a layer of brown hair, the ancient Celts believed the wolver was descended from wolf kind. The terrifying temperament of your typical werewolf is not so apparent in the wolver. Although he takes a less palatable form, he is known for being fairly sedate and friendly. Regarded as a benign, approachable being, you can spot a wolver fairly regularly around the Shetland Islands. They can often be seen sitting on a stone, fishing in a loch or river for their dinner. These stones, named Wolverstains, are usually flat rocks located on the banks of rivers and lochs. With an abundance of patience, the wolver may spend hours sitting on the stone 
while they fish for food. The story is slightly hazy on where the wolver got their fishing tackle from, but the common theories suggest they either made it from materials they had to hand, or they stole it. A helpful creature, the wolver has been known to help a traveller out if lost in the countryside, leading them to the nearest village or town. The wolver would make sure any lost soul would find safety. Poor families that were starving may find a supply of fish left on their windowsill by the wolver. The same gifts would be given to any family with a sick resident, with the wolver sitting sadly outside the home of the terminally ill. This friendly creature has been known to kill but only in self-defence. Living in a dugout cave, halfway up a hill, the wolver prefers a solitary life. Their ability to be thin and gracefully fast comes from their need to escape from human and kelpie predators. Some believe that the wolver is immortal and will lead you to buried treasure in ancient ruins. Another belief is that the wolver is tied to hellbounds and black shucks, which are omens of death. The legend goes that should you see a wolver, you are bound for imminent death. If you come across wolver bones, you must not take one, for those that do are guaranteed a visit from a vicious black dog, hell-bent on retrieving his bone. This story is called A Shepherd in Wolf's Clothing. The Wolver, a mythical creature known for its kindness and helpfulness, lived in a small village nestled among the trees. It was half man and half wolf, with the body of a man and the face and paws of a wolf. Its fur was thick and grey, and its eyes held a wisdom that belied its animal nature. The wolver was a solitary creature, preferring to live apart from others but it could not help but feel a deep empathy for those in need. The village was surrounded by dense forests, and sometimes travellers would lose their way whilst trying to find their way through the maze of trees. When this happened, the wolver would appear guiding them back to safety. It also brought gifts to the poorest families in the village, leaving fish on their doorsteps or fresh game hanging from their windowsills. 
The wooer was especially attentive to those whose loved ones were ill. Sitting outside their homes and keeping vigil right until the end. One day, the wolver noticed a traveller walking aimlessly through the forest, clearly very lost. It approached the man, who looked exhausted and frightened. The wolver gently nudged him with its nose, guiding him in the direction of the village. As they walked, the wolver introduced itself and explained that it would help the traveller find its way back to safety. The man, grateful and relieved, thanked the wolver profusely. Over the course of that day, the wolver led the traveller through the forest, pointing out landmarks and helping him navigate the winding paths. As they walked, the traveller told the wolver of his journey and the hardships he had faced along the way. The wolver listened intently, empathising with the man's struggles and offered words of comfort and encouragement. As the sun began to set, they finally emerged from the trees and saw the village in the distance. The traveller thanked the wolver again, promising to tell everyone he met about the kindness and generosity he had experienced at the hands of the mythical creature. The wolver never one to seek recognition or praise, simply nodded and turned back towards the forest, disappearing into the shadows. In the days that followed, the traveller made his way back home, his heart lighter and his spirit renewed. He kept the memory of the wolver close to his heart and vowed to live his life in a way that honoured the creature's selflessness and compassion. Upon his return, he told his family and friends of the encounter and word spread throughout the land of the mysterious and benevolent creature known as the Wolver, who roamed the forests, guiding lost souls and bringing hope to those in need. As for the Wolver, it continued to live in solitude wandering the forest and tending to those who crossed its path. Its legend grew and many came to see it as a symbol of hope and redemption. Some even began to leave offerings and gifts at the base of the tree where the wolver was known to sleep as a way of showing their gratitude and respect for the creature that had touched their lives in so many profound and lasting ways. Chapter 2 Selkies
What can we say about our native Selkies? Apart from that they are everywhere in Scotland's waters. The name is actually Orcadian for seal, and so that should give you a good clue as to what they are. While they're in the water, they look like regular seals doing what seals regularly do. However, selkies have the power to remove their seal skins and walk ashore in human form. If they should lose their skin for any reason, they find themselves trapped on land. The exact details change from place to place and story to story. Some claim that they can transform at will, others that it's only during full moons or just a limited number of times. One constant detail though is that the Scottish Selkie is irresistibly beautiful whilst in human form. Relationships between humans and Selkies form the backbone of most stories. Unfortunately, it rarely ends well. That doesn't mean that Selkies are necessarily malicious creatures. In fact, they are often on the receiving end of mistreatment from humans. Generally, they are much gentler than other creatures of Scottish folklore. In a physical sense, anyway. There goes a story of the Selkie Wife and is by far the most common legend. It's so popular that this tale doesn't just relate to Scottish Selkies, it's even made its way to the Faroe Isles. One night, a young man catches a glimpse of something strange happening down by the beach. As he creeps up behind a rock, he realises it's a group of selkies dancing in the moonlight. While the entire sight is captivating, there was one girl in particular that the man couldn't keep his eyes off. When the dancing was over, the selkie folk wander back to where their seal skins are laid out, slipping them on and disappearing into the waves. The mesmerizing girl is last to approach her skin, but right before she could touch it, the man rushed out and grabbed it himself. By this point, the sun was rising, and without the ability to return to the sea, she was resigned to follow the thief home. Over the years, the couple were married and even had children, but all the while the Selkie's skin was hidden away, until one day, while the selkie wife was finishing her chores, her son approached with something strange in his hands. It was her seal skin, found buried away where nobody but a bored young boy would look. The selkie wife loved her children, but the call of the sea 
was just too much. And just as her husband returned home, he saw her sprinting across the beach with the seal skin in hand. He never saw her again, but any time the children were down by the shoreline, a curious seal could be seen bobbing away in the distance. Another story goes by the Selkie and the Hunter. Now, not everyone believes in these creatures, and that once included Donald the Seal Hunter from John O'Groats up the north of Scotland. Donald made his living hunting the seals around the coastline and never paid any attention to the old legends. To him, a seal was a seal and was nothing more than a way to make a living. One day, Donald saw a huge seal stretched out on the rocks. He knew how valuable a skin of that size would be, and so he crept up with his sharpest knife and plunged it deep. His prey bellowed in pain before diving into the sea, taking Donald's best knife with it. Donald was furious at losing both his catch and his knife. He was still sulking about it that night when there was a knock at the door. A tall, handsome stranger stood outside and asked for the famous seal hunter. His lord had requested a large number of skins and would be delighted if Donald accompanied him to his hall. Donald was not going to turn down an opportunity like this. Without hesitating, he leapt up on the stranger's horse and off they sped. He started to get a little nervous when the horse took the cliff road. Those nerves turned to sheer horror as the horse galloped directly towards the edge and dived into thin air. As they plunged into the sea, Donald was dragged far below the waves to a hidden door in the rocks. On entering, he saw a great host of seals with sad looks on their faces. The big seal from earlier was lying in the middle of the room with a horrendous gash in his side. The stranger that Donald had arrived with then presented him with a blade and a cold dread came over him. He instantly recognised his best knife. His host said to him, Donald, you will have guessed that we are no ordinary seals. We are selkies, and even though you have slain many of our kin, we mean you no harm. I brought you here because you are the only person who can save our king. Only your hands can close the wound they opened. 
Donald was distraught at the pain he had caused these creatures. He didn't know what good it would do, but he stepped up to the dying Selkie and reached out with his hands. Slowly and tenderly, Donald pushed the wound closed, and as if by magic, it started to heal over. The Selkies barked their approval as the king raised himself up, and Donald sighed with relief. Luckily for Donald, Selkies aren't vengeful beings, and allowed him to return home on one condition. He willingly promised never to hurt another seal in his life. This story is called A Selkie's Gift. It was the most unremarkable of days in the most unremarkable of Scottish villages. The sun a golden orb just beginning to slip beneath the horizon, cast a warm glow over the thatched cottages and the rolling glens beyond. The air was crisp and clean, carrying with it a faint scent of salt and seaweed mixed with heather and gorse flowers. A young man named Ewan, dressed in worn but sturdy clothes, trudged wearily up the dirt road, his shoulders hunched against the chill of the evening. He had been working on the farm all day, tending to his sheep and harvesting what little vegetables the rocky soil would yield. The labour was hard and relentless, but it was all he knew. It was all he had ever known. Ewan was just about to turn onto his own lane when he caught sight of something strange and wonderful in the distance. There on the shoreline of a nearby sea loch was a creature unlike anything he had ever seen before. It looked like it was part seal, but also very much a woman. Its shimmering pelt glistened in the fading light. For a moment, he was transfixed, unable to look away from the sight before him. It was as if some enchanting spell had been cast upon him, pulling him irresistibly toward the mysterious creature. As he drew closer, he realised that the creature was not alone. There were others like it, their sleek forms basking in the warmth of the setting sun. They seemed to be engaged in some sort of ritual, their graceful movements and haunting cries filling the air with an eerie beauty. 
Ewan simply stood there, watching in awe as the Selkies, as he now knew them, performed their ancient rites. He felt as if he had stumbled across a secret world hidden just beyond the edge of his mundane existence. His curiosity getting the better of him, Ewan ventured closer still. One of the Selkies, a striking female with eyes as green as the loch itself, glanced up at him. For a very brief moment, their gazes locked, and he felt a shiver run down his spine. It was as if she could see straight into his soul, understanding the longing and wonder that filled his heart. Without a word, she beckoned him forwards, urging him to join their circle. Intrigued and yet cautious, Ewan approached the group of Selkies. They parted to make room for him, their movements graceful and fluid, like dancers in a celestial ballet. As he knelt beside the female Selkie who had called to him, she smiled, revealing a mouthful of sharp white teeth. Her breath smelled of the sea, and something wild and free. For a fleeting moment, he felt as if he had found a home amongst these creatures, as if he belonged with them. But even as he knelt there, gazing into the mesmerizing eyes of the female, Ewan knew that he could not abandon his life and his family. They depended on him, just as he depended on them. Reluctantly, he forced himself to tear his gaze away from the Selkies and stand up once more. Thank you for letting me join you, he said, his voice barely audible over the gentle lappings of the waves. It's been a true honour. The Selkies, sensing his hesitation, regarded him with understanding and sympathy. They did not press him to stay, for they knew that his choice was a difficult one. They understood that he belonged to another world, a world of earth and stone and endless fields of barley. And yet, they also knew that a part of him belonged to the sea and the sky, to a wild freedom that they embodied. Before he left them, the woman Selkie bestowed upon him a wish of endless good fortune one of high-yield crops, fertile livestock, and a lifetime of food and water for his family. Unable to truly comprehend the Selkie's generosity, and feeling a little guilty, 
he merely nodded shyly, thanking them in a soft, quiet voice. As Ewan turned away from the shore, his heart heavy with the weight of his decision, the Selkies watched him go. They knew he would carry a piece of them with him, and they would always hold a place in his heart. For they were not just animals, not just creatures of myth and legend. They were beings of the in-between, bound by the eternal dance between the land and the sea, between the human and the wild. And so, as the sun dipped below the horizon, Ewan trudged up the lane, his thoughts spinning like the tide. He knew that he could never truly leave the Selkies behind now, for they had left an indelible mark on his soul. And though he could not follow them now, he vowed that one day he would return to the loch to once more stand beside them beneath the stars and to find his place amidst the infinite expanse of the sea. A number of months later, as he made his way home from the fields, his heart still heavy with the weight of that decision he made long before, he saw her again. The silky female was there, waiting for him as she had been before. This time, however, she was alone. A shiver ran down his spine as he realised she had come seeking him out, and that she had felt the connection between them as strongly as he had. Ewan, she called to him, her voice as soft and seductive as the lapping of the waves. I have come to ask a favour of you. He stopped in his tracks, unable to tear his gaze away from her. What is it, my lady? he asked, his voice little more than a whisper. She glided closer, her movements graceful and fluid as before, like the dance of the stars above them. I know that you have made your choice, she said, her eyes boring into his soul. But I want you to know that you could have had a life with us. A life of freedom and wonder. I believe that you misunderstand me, he said, trying to steady his voice. I am grateful for the gift you have given me, for the blessings you have bestowed upon my land and my people. But I must remain here, for they need me. The silky female nodded, her expression softening. I understand, she said, a note of sadness in her voice. But know this, Ewan MacLeod. 
the bond between us is not so easily severed. You will always carry a piece of me with you, and I will always be with you in spirit, if not in flesh. As she spoke, the air around them seemed to shimmer, as if the very fabric of reality was momentarily thinning. And then, before his eyes, she shifted, transforming back into the magnificent Selkie that she truly was. With a flick of her tail, she dove into the sea lock, disappearing beneath the surface, leaving Ewan standing there. The memory of her touch and her voice echoing through him like a prayer. From that day forwards, Ewan's farm flourished like never before, his crops bearing fruit in abundance, his herds growing strong and healthy. It was as if some unseen force was guiding him, helping him to succeed in his and his family's endeavours. And though he knew that he could never truly be with the Selkies again, he also knew that a part of him always would be, forever bound to the wild and free spirit of the sea. Chapter 3 The Dreaded Three-Formed Witch of War The Morrigan The Raven has long been an omen of ill tidings around the world, bearer of bad news and warnings. But in the Celts and Ireland, it was known once as a servant of the fairy Morrigan, or the raven was herself in person. The Morrigan's name meant the great or ghost queen, from the old words for fear and greatness. Some will tell you earnestly that she was a goddess, and that she had three forms, those of a maiden, mother, and a crone. Yet others will say Morrigan was but a title-like priestess. Christian chronicles record it to mean a monster in the form of a woman. There are those scholars who say she was one and the same as the Banshee, and that Savin itself was dedicated to her. Eru, granddaughter of Noada, wife of the last Tulcha High King, who gave her very name to Ireland, was claimed to have been among her followers, as she was head of the Bar, the Battle Spirits. Whatever the truth, we first hear of the Morrigan fighting alongside the warriors of Tuara de Danann in their struggles with the fair bog, and then the Fomers, who came from afar to conquer and enslave. 
In her raven coat she'd soar above bloody battlefields, which she called her garden. Her cry emboldened those she favoured into battle fury, reestrach, and putting terror on those she opposed. Before the second battle of Moitura, where fell Balor of the Evil Eye, Dagdamor held a tryst with Morrigan by the waters of the river Unius in Connachta, bearing her to the glen Etin. And so impressed was she with his various endowments and endurance that she promised to bring all the druids of Ireland to the aid of the Tuatha in the coming battle. She then bound up the loins of the foamers so they couldn't relieve themselves and hid in the waters of Ireland from them. And when she came up at last to the battle itself, Prince Nuada asked her what she could do to help them. In answer, she spiralled up into the air and rained down fire and blood through a strange and poisoned fog, breaking the former host of King Indech with a chant so powerful that they ran into the ocean. There arose a wild, impetuous, precipitate, mad, inoxorable, furious, dark, lacerating, merciless, combative, contentious bath, which was shrieking and fluttering over their heads. And there arose also the satyrs and sprites and the maniacs of the valleys, and the witches, and goblins, and owls, and destroying demons of the air and firmament, and the demoniac phantom host. And they were inciting and sustaining valour and battle with them. Over his head is shrieking a lean hag, quickly hopping over the points of their weapons and shields. She is the grey-haired Morrigu. After it was done, she took two handfuls of that king's blood to the hosts that were waiting at the ford of Unius. So, Ford of Destruction became its name. When the battle spoils were divided, and the bodies given to the earth or the sky, the Tuatha and the fairy hosts, and the mountains and rivers of Ireland, asked the Morrigan, had she any tales to tell? So, she spoke this prophecy. Under the gentle sky lies the earth, restful at last in the arms of heaven. As sweet wine or a fine meal is the land for all to eat and drink beneath the stars. Before me I see this wonderful land. Like a splendid mead, rich and worthy of savouring, keeping fresh summer's blessing even in stark winter, giving us shelter like a shield makes a strong spear, and as a fist holding the shield our strong places, hungry for battle. None can break these spear-bristled walls. 
here we harvest and here we stand. And here will nine times the grandchildren of our children grow fair and bold, and the fields will be like forests, with fences surrounding and horns calling the beasts of the field, the sun shining not beneath soft leaves, rich with sap, so they bend with the weight. So much will this land bring that every pauper will be as a king, and every boy a warrior of renown, every dog a fierce champion. Straight and tall will grow the trees, so that each shall fruit a spear. The fire shall bring warmth and melt the metal. Strong will be the foundations, and rich will be the milk. Every cow shall be full with calf, birds singing like clouds above. The beasts of the wild shall leap for joy in spring, and on savin the ripe harvest. Many and many will be the people of this land, filling it from peak to ocean, fair and fruitful. As the water runs over the sharp rocks, so shall time through shadow and fear. But this will be the tale of the land and its people. Ours will be the peace of heaven beneath the skies for all of eternity. She wasn't always on the side of the children of the Tocha either. Where she and Cuchulin met, she didn't see the truth of her and gave her foul insult before leaping to the attack. Just in time she changed into a raven and sat on a branch close by, mocking him with her croaks. And then he discerned her true nature, so he gave his grudging apology. But she said to him, It is at the guarding of thy death that I am and I shall be. Relations between the two soured after that, and when Queen Med brought war with her to claim the famed brown boo of Kulin, Cuchulin spurned the embrace of the Morrigan and her offer to help along with it. When he fought the Queen's armies, Morrigan became an eel who tripped him up then a wolf who stampeded cattle across the ford, and finally a white crow with red ears, leading the stampede. Three times she interfered with Cuchulain, and three times he wounded her. After the battle, she appeared as an old crone, and Cuchulain begged her for some milk she was getting from a cow. She gave him milk from the third teat, and her leg was healed by his blessing. You told me once, she said, that you would never heal me. Had I known it was you, said Cuchulain, I never would have. On the eve of the battle of Myrhemen, she then came to him as three old women, crones roasting a dog over the Rowan pit fire. His Gius or 
holy taboo was that he could never eat the flesh of a dog. But the crones mocked him in his manhood until he eventually took a bite. And then his death came the very next day. As he died, he bound himself to a standing stone with his own entrails to die on his feet. And none of his enemies would come close until the morrigan perched on his shoulder in the form of a raven. It shouldn't be imagined, mind you, that the morrigan was an entirely battlesome sort either, as Dermot Odun found when he came across her in the shape of an old crone struggling to ford a river. After he'd taken the morrigan upon his broad back, she granted him the gift of comeliness, and said that no woman could turn from his eye. Then again, that gift started him feuding with none other than Fian McCummel over a lady named Grainne. So perhaps even her blessings are double-edged. Her name is remembered throughout the Celts and Ireland in hills called the Breasts, or Paps of the Morrigan and by ancient fire pits where young men gather before battle. She is also said to have lured a young woman called Odras into the other world through the cave of the cats near Kruachin and turned her into a pool of water. Chapter 4 Dagda The Dagda was chief of the Troche de Danan and foremost of the Irish ancestral gods. Highly skilled and wise beyond measure, he was not only the god of life and death, but of seasons, agriculture, fertility, magic, and druidry as well. He wielded three sacred treasures, a cauldron of plenty, a club of life and death, and a harp that controlled men and seasons alike. His children were plentiful, as were his lovers. His dwelling place was Brunoboine. The Dagda was a title meaning the good or great god, and that reflects his mastery over many skills rather than the fortitude of his character. As the great god, the Dagda possesses immense skill that gave him dominion over a wide range of fields. He was not only the god of life and death, but of fertility and agriculture too. And the Dagda possessed many items which granted him further abilities. He could set the seasons to order with the strum of his harp, slay or resurrect a man with his club, 
or provide a generous feast with his cauldron. The Dagda was also a druid, and as such had mastery over all things magical and mystical. The Dagda was described as a giant of a man, oafish in both demeanour and attire. His beard was long and unruly, and he wore a woollen cloak about his head. His clothing never quite fit right, often exposing his stomach and buttocks. Nevertheless, these faults did little to detract from his good looks. Some scholars have even theorised that his gruff appearance came from the Christians who recorded Irish myths and traditions. These early historians may have wished to make the Dagda appear comedic and foolish in contrast to their own deity. Even in these portrayals, however, the Dagda was still described as wise, witty, and wily on a consistent basis. Such versions also allowed him to remain a druid, schooled in magic, art, and military strategy. The Dagda often carried three sacred relics with him that defined several of his many talents. The choir and sick, a cauldron that could produce a bountiful feast. One could never be found wanting in the company of the Dagda. This particular relic was one of the four treasures of the Tocha de Danan, which were crafted in Murius. The Lorg Mor, the mighty club that possessed two distinct powers. Its head had the power to slay nine men in a single swing, whilst its handle could revive the slain with but a simple touch. The Urania, an ornate harp carved of oak, this harp could place the seasons in the proper order and command the wills and emotions of men. With these potent abilities, the Dagda was often seen as a god of order putting everything in its place. Every time it's in season and every man to their rightful action. In addition to these items, the Dagda owned two pegs, one always growing, the other always roasting, and an orchard that bore perennial sweet fruits. The origins of the Dagda are found in the Labor Gabala Erin. They laid out the coming of the Turcha de Danan, the fifth group of settlers to arrive in mythical Ireland. This group hailed from four cities north of the Emerald Isle, where they had learned the arts and sciences of their time, including magic. At this time, the Dagda was their chief. Though he did not hold the title of king, he was consulted and respected by many as if he was one. The Courting of Bowen 
The doctor fell for Bowen, goddess of the river Boyne, and wife of Elamar, a judge of the Trocha de Danon. In order to court her, the Dagda sent Elamar away to the High King Bress. With her husband out of the way, Bowen soon fell pregnant with the Dagda's child. To prevent Elamar from seeking retribution against the child, the Dagda held the son in place for nine months, allowing Bowen to carry and to give birth to the child in a single day. The Dagda then gave the child to his son Midir to raise, and the boy became Angus, god of love and poetry. Bru na Boyne. In time, Angus grew to manhood, and the Dagda helped him trick Elamar out of his rightful home at Bru na Boyne. Using a carefully worded ploy befitting the gods of wisdom and poetry, they asked Elamar to allow them to dwell there for a day and a night. This old Irish phrase had two meanings, a literal day and a night, and all days and nights. In agreeing to their request, Elamar had unwittingly given his home to his enemies for eternity. Soon after, the Dagda and Bowen assisted Angus in his quest to find the girl haunting his dreams. Some time later, whilst Angus was away, the Dagda distributed his land among his many children. Upon his return, Angus discovered that his father had saved nothing for him. Using the same careful wording through which they had gained their home, Angus tricked the Dagda into passing Bru na Boyne onto him. Then there is the Second Battle of Moitura. The story goes that upon arriving in Ireland, the Tuacha de Danon consolidated power by eliminating or conquering the land's earlier settlers. Those most powerful of these groups was the Fomorians, a monstrous race ruled by the cruel king Balor. Knowing conflict with the Fomorians was inevitable, the Dagda made careful plans to trick them out of key resources, including their sheep. On the Savan, he went to his wife, the Morrigan, goddess of battle and of death, and found her bathing. After they made love, she prophesied the coming battle, she would be victorious over the Fomorians at a price. At long last, both sides met at Moitura in County Sligo, where they fought for control of Ireland. During the fierce battle, both Balor and the Dagda's brother, Nuada, were laid low. The Dagda himself was also mortally wounded 
by Kethlin, wife of Balor. During the battle, the Dagda's magic heart was stolen, though it was ultimately recovered later. After the battle, the Dagda returned to Bru Naboin, where he succumbed to his injuries and was laid to rest in the mounds. At his time of death, he had already ruled for 70 or 80 years, depending on what you read. Like many of the Tuacha de Danan, he could still be consulted by those visiting the Fairy Mounds, as well as those who drifted into the perilous other world. This story is called The Love of Morrigan and Dagda. The Dagda, chief of the Tuacha de Danan, surveyed the land before him. His long silver hair flowed freely in the wind as he stood atop a hill, overlooking the lush greenery of Ireland. The air was thick with the scent of earth and new life, and the sound of birdsong filled the air. He raised his staff carved from the trunk of a great oak tree, its branches twisting and turning like the limbs of some ancient wise creature. In his other hand, he clutched a harp of gold, its strings made from the finest silk and spun by the fairies themselves. As he played, the world seemed to fall into a trance-like state. The animals of the forest ceased their rustling, and even the wind died down, leaving only the notes of his harp to fill the air. The trees swayed gently as if they were dancing to the music, and the flowers bowed their heads in reverence. It was a sight to behold, this god of life and death, this bringer of fertility and magic, standing tall and proud amidst his creations. His attention was drawn to a nearby stream, where his beloved Morrigan, the triple goddess of war, fate and death, was bathing herself in the cool, clear water. Her hair, as black as the deepest ocean, cascaded down around her like a waterfall, and her skin glowed in an unearthly radiance. She was naked, save for a cloak of raven feathers that billowed out behind her, and a sword strapped to her hip. As she rose from the water, she glanced up at Dagda 
and smiled, her teeth sharp and white against her dark skin. My love, she purred, her voice like the rush of the stream. The battle of Moitura approaches, and we must prepare. The battle of Moitura was to decide the fate of the Tuacha de Danan as they fought against the Formorians for control of Ireland. Dagda knew that Morrigan, with her fierce warrior spirit and uncanny battle prowess, would be an invaluable asset in the coming conflict. He nodded gravely, his gaze never leaving her. I will join you soon, he said, his voice deep and resonant. First I must gather the forces of nature around us, so that we may have their aid in battle to come. With that, Dagda began to play his harp once more, summoning the spirits of the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. They appeared before him, each in their own unique form. The earth spirit was a stoic, mountainous giant. The air spirit took the form of a great golden eagle. The fire spirit was an awe-inspiring, raging inferno. And the water spirit was a mighty, churning whirlpool. As they bowed their heads in respect to the chief god, Dagda bestowed upon them each a sacred task to perform in the coming battle. The earth spirit was to dig trenches and fortify the positions of the Tuacha de Danan, whilst the air spirit would scout the enemy lines and report back to Dagda. The fire spirit would be unleashed upon the Formorians, destroying their numbers and spreading fear and confusion amongst them. And finally, the water spirit would quench the flames of the Fomorian's army's weapons, making them less effective in combat. With these tasks assigned, Dagda turned to the Morrigan, his face set in a grim expression. My love, he said, the time has come. Together they walked down the hill, their footsteps leaving an indelible mark upon the earth. As they approached the battlefield, the sound of their footsteps echoed through the air stirring the spirits of the Tuacha de Danan and the Fomorians alike. The air was thick with tension. 
the smell of blood and sweat mixing with the earthy scent of the land. Morrigan drew her sword, its blade gleaming in the light, and took their place at Dagda's side. They stood there, towering above the armies that lay before them, like gods of old, come to decide the fate of mortal men. The battle was fierce and brutal, with the Fomorians fighting with a desperate fury born of their knowledge that they were doomed to lose. The Tuacha de Danan, emboldened by their belief that their fate was victorious, savaged and matched them in their willingness to prevail. After hours, if not days, of battle, both armies were spent. Left were only two soldiers, stood before Dagda and Morrigan, panting, bloodied and poised. In the silence of the battlefield, only their heaving lungs could be heard. The two opposing soldiers nodded to each other, lowered their weapons, turned and left in the direction from which they'd came. The battle was done. Dagda and Morrigan looked to each other, knowing their roles were also complete. And so they, too, left the field of battle until another time, hand in hand, two halves of the same equation, both Grave, both powerful, both god and goddess of life and death. Chapter 5 The Water Horse The Isle of Sky Set off the west coast of Scotland, this misty place has long been a place of mystery and wonder. Its rugged landscape, with its ancient standing stones and mystic lens, has inspired generations of poets and storytellers. But none have been as terrifying as the legend of the Loch Dubrachan water horse. For centuries, locals have spoken of a massive black beast that lurks in the depths of the loch, waiting to drag unsuspecting travellers to a watery grave. I grew up on the Isle of Skye, only a few miles from Loch Dubrachen. And as a child, the loch 
oozed menace in a way that's difficult to put into words. There was something about its dark, deep, bottomless appearance that made the myths of such creatures so wonderfully believable. And never a time did pass where I wouldn't at least regard the loch wondering if there was anything I could see lurking in the gloom. And so this story is called The Water Horse of Slate. It wasn't until recently that the local authorities decided enough was enough. The constant reports of hauntings and sightings could no longer be ignored. It was time to trawl the loch and capture this beast once and for all. Word spread quickly, and soon a large group of brave souls had gathered at the shores of the loch. They were mostly MacLeods and MacDonalds, the two most prominent clans in the southern tip of the isle. As they prepared to launch their boats and nets, a sense of both dread and anticipation hung heavy in the air. On that gloomy grey afternoon, the nets were cast out and the boats rowed in unison across the surface of the loch. It didn't take long for them to feel the net tugging on something, and when they pulled it back to shore, they found it was caught on something large and unyielding. The water horse had surely been trapped. In panic, the local townsfolk fled back to their homes, fearing the worst. All but one. A young lad who had been too scared to join the hunt in the first place, now found himself standing alone beside the log. He couldn't quite explain why, but something told him that whatever was down there wasn't the monster everyone claimed it to be. As he waited by the log, his heart racing with a mixture of fear and determination, he couldn't help but notice the way the water rippled and churned beneath the surface. The net continued to strain against whatever it was caught in, and he wondered what it must be like to face whatever lurked below. Another hour passed, and still nothing happened. The net showed no signs of giving way, and the only sound that filled the air was the soft lapping of the waves against the shore. Just as he was beginning to think that perhaps he had been wrong, 
and the water horse was truly a monster after all. He noticed a movement beneath the surface of the water. The net suddenly gave way, and with a mighty surge, a massive black horse burst from the depths and onto the shore. Its coat was as sleek as polished ebony, and its eyes glowed with an unearthly fire. Fear rooted the boy to the spot as the horse reared up on its hind legs and let out a thunderous snort. It seemed to be studying him, sizing him up. After a tense moment, the horse lowered its head and trotted away into the mist, disappearing from sight. The boy stood there, shaking and panting, his heart racing. He couldn't believe what had just happened. When he finally found the courage to return home, he was met with disbelief and derision. The townsfolk had heard stories of the water horse, and they simply couldn't fathom why he would think it was nothing other than a beast of malice. To their knowledge, the water horse was a savage beast that would have taken his life in a heartbeat, so they dismissed his tale as the ramblings of a frightened boy, and soon word spread that the loch had been trolled and the water horse was indeed captured. But the boy knew the truth. He had seen the horse with his own eyes, and he knew that the legend of Loch Duberchen was far more complicated and far more complex than anyone could ever have imagined.